Hello, everybody. David Wallach here, and welcome to number three in the Shut Up David series. Today, we've got a special guest um, to come and talk to you about, in my opinion, one of the most important facets of safety. It's really where safety, where the rubber hits the road, where most the most damage and the most benefit can be done in an organization when we're talking about safety and we're talking about behaviors, and we're talking about culture, and we're talking about how people are dealt with and the reactions of leaders. And it's a melting pot of uh, the sharp end of safety, in my opinion, in my experience, in my time that I've, I've worked in safety. This is where this is where an organization can make or break how safety is perceived and enacted on in the organization. And it's the point where an organization starts to investigate incidents and things that have gone wrong. So without much more ado, we'll bring in Mr. Mark Holston from Investigations Differently. Good day, Mark. How are you going? Good. Yourself, David? No. Too bad, mate. Not too bad. Thank you very much. A bit, still a bit warm here in WA. Um, sorry, what was that? Hello to all the subscribers. Yes, <laughs> it's growing by the day, which is which is amazing to be honest with you. But uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, thank you for agreeing to come on today. I know you're flat stick at the moment. You've got a lot going on, a lot of training going on, a lot of a lot of work going on. I see from your LinkedIn as well that you. You're actually looking for more resources. You got so much work that you need to start to expand as well. So good times for your organization, for your business. Yeah, good, good, good which problem is, to have, I guess. Where, yeah, which is amazing. Awesome. Right. Well, why don't we start off, Mark, with um, if you could give us a brief intro as to who you are um, and what you do, that would be awesome. For people who don't know you already, I mean, you're pretty famous here in Australia, but uh, obviously this is going to go out to the wider world. Um, <laughs> famous or infamous? I don't know which one. Which one's like. uh, probably neither. Um, yeah, look, uh, so yeah, Mark Alston, look, I um, founded and am the director of Investigations Differently. We're an organisation that specialises um, in two niche areas, or niche areas of safety, and that is investigations and critical risk management that, that's our complete focus so we, we don't stray too far from there we can occasionally um for, for clients when they really ask us to but otherwise we focus um on those areas and that that enables us to you know um, concentrate our research efforts um our innovation just in those in those yeah. two particular streams um yeah, very focused very focused um we work with we work with um, organisations across the world. Um, you know, we work, work with you know, large large components like ABB that you know based out of Europe, and we work with the um, over in New Zealand and Royal Australian Air Force, and and, and yeah, like a heap of organisations are um, uh, basically in those two spaces and focus on that. Um, in terms of personally, um, I was an ex federal agent with the Australian Federal Police. Don't hold it against oh. me. Uh, um, I, I think we're having technical difficulties. We might be losing you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, Just kidding, that, mate. Yeah. So that was interesting. It, you know, it taught me one way of investigations, but you know, the, the, there's a complete 180 degree difference between uh, a criminal investigation and, and what we talk about, which is the discovery and, and learning and managing risk, uh, which is for us the, the, the highlight of 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 what we do in investigation so um yeah. i ended up in mining believe it or not after i left the federal police as an operator uh, which which gave me a real uh, and then when i say operator i was on trucks and and diggers and, yeah, right. and stuff up and all sorts of stuff and and uh, Big shift. uh and, and to be quite frank i was not the best operator so i may have had been involved in the odd incident um in my time uh, transition to safety uh, for, for one of the big mining, mining organisations and uh, got a taste of their Kool-Aid that they drink um, <laughs> and, and really um, was uncomfortable um, with that. Um, and, Why is that? Um, yeah, heavily blame focused, very linear, um, you know, the whole zero harm thing that was on at the time. Um, just, it, it just, it was imagination-based safety, not practical-based safety. Um, wow, I've not heard that before. It's an interesting, it's an interesting metaphor, isn't it? Yeah, imagination-based. So, 
Yeah, so if you leverage a bit off, you know, um, Todd's, um, Todd's, you know, work as imagined, um, yeah. it's safety as imagined, right? Um, the, 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 the mistaken belief that we can, that every accident's preventable um, and, and leadership at the front, standing in front of a room saying every actions, every, every incident's preventable, well, it's, it's just a nonsense. Uh, and they know it. And the thing is, they know it. They know it yeah. because if you look at any of their risk registers, any risk register for any organisation that's in the zero harm world, um, and, and as aspiration, I don't mind it, right? Good aspiration. But at those that use it as a target and so forth, look at any of their risk registers and none of their risk registers are zeroed out to no risk. Yeah. Because if they believed every accident was pre preventable, you put these controls in, um, big, zero risk. No harm. Zero no harm, right? Yeah. But not one has it. In fact, all of them do, most of those majors do critical risk management, so they, they still acknowledge this critical risk. So, you know, that 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 level of discomfort forced me to to, to explore um, what else was out there in the safety world, because it was either that or go back to operations. And and that's when I started doing things like reading, um, you know, Todd Conklin and Decker and Holnagel and Woods and papers like those. and. You know, and, and, and even more recently, you know, papers from Dave Proven and, um, and and those people and start to really understand, like, we'll move away from imagination-based safety to real practical safety that can be achieved by people at the work front with, yep. the, with the capabilities they have and the capacity of their organisation to implement things. Um, yeah, until we get to that space, then then we're, we're going to live in imagination-based safety for a while. So you, okay, so let me just do a quick summary here. So you started off Australian Federal Police. From there, you got a job um, on the mine sites as an operator. Um, Self-admittedly, you weren't very good at that. So <laughs> transitioned into safety, which, which yeah. uh, we all do at some point. Um, and then you've got exposure to how these organizations treat their people when something goes wrong and that yeah. didn't feel right to you that didn't sit right with your your morals or your values how was that different to how the australian federal police would treat people during investigations oh uh, well, it's, well it's almost no different um ah, right okay any police force um treats um people as criminals uh if they're, they're like if they believe someone's done something wrong or broken the law they treat them as a criminal, right? Um, yeah. And that's the problem with um, too many organisations now is that blame the worker. You're basically treating the worker as a criminal. They've yeah. broken a procedure instead of a law, so therefore we must punish them. Um, but there's no, but there's very limited discovery after that. Now that being said, there's been some great, you know, strides made in the last five years uh, by some organisations with G there's still a lot a long way to go yeah roger okay well that brings us on quite nicely then so we've got this um blame culture in organizations when it comes to instant investigations and finding out what went wrong yeah and it seems to be the default setting it seems to be the natural powerful course when it comes to dealing with those types of things so what can people do differently what can what can organizations do differently and what are the benefits that they would get from doing it differently? Um, probably. Oh, by the way, sorry, Mark, for jumping in there. If you want me to pull up any of the slides at any point. I was going to say, pull up, that first, pull up that first slide. Yeah. Um, let's go sure, through that. I think that will give us a bit, of, a bit of an indication. So the first thing we need to do is change our objective of an incident investigation, prevent reoccurrence, re to learn and reduce risk. And the reason we, we need to do that is because if we have an objective that doesn't work for us or isn't driving the right behaviour, we're not going to get the right outcomes. And, and there's, again, it's almost this zero harm belief that we can prevent every accident. So, you know, we, we, I used to write procedures that said uh, we will, every event should be, incident should be re reported, recorded, investigated, or identified root causes and actions put in to prevent reoccurrence. And I think most organisations that still pretty much have a similar procedure that says that. We're not very successful at preventing reoccurrence. Um, and and, no. and similar, you know, we, we have similar incidents all the time. And there's a number of reasons for that. The, the first reason is 
to absolutely guarantee we never have um so just like a forklift incident again and never have never have forklift incidents in our business we would actually have to eliminate the use of forklifts now yes. for many businesses that use forklifts that's neither practical nor reasonable um so they don't um so what they end up doing is because elimination doesn't work or can't work or they don't even look at it they don't even consider it actually they go straight to administration and if we were to if, we were going to, if people were to go back to their investigations from the previous 12 months and and remove every action that or, or count the number of administration actions they have out of their investigation reports on average they'd probably find around 90 percent at least 90 percent right, okay. admin actions which we know do nothing to manage future future issues they do nothing um so that's that's the first thing the second thing about that as an objective it makes makes us focus our discovery on the event purely on the event itself now some methodologies and models will pay lip service to to in work environment um but predominantly that's done very poorly and we have this linear focus on the event the problem is the event doesn't occur in isolation the event occurs as a, as a result of the context of the work, like as a context of the task. And if we if we change our our objective from learning um, to a learning objective um, and managing risk, it actually frees us up as, as an investigator to really explore and discover the risks of the work uh, rather than what we know. So. Um, I'll, just a slight rabbit hole here. Um, Dave, I'll ask this, I'll ask this, uh, and this is a question without notice, so I apologise. But do you know what the, so there's a risk management standard, I think it's um, 31,000, right? Do you know what the yep. definition of risk is, that they define risk is uh, in, that, in that standard? Oh, God, you've tested me now. Um, I, is it the uh, release of uncontrolled energy that causes harm to people or environment? something like no, that no no it's 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 the it's this it's the effect of uncertainty on our objectives so i'll repeat that wow the effect of uncertainty on our objectives because remember the risk management standard is not purely about health and safety it's it's enterprise risk right so the objective in health and safety is to keep people health and safety so it's the 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 effect of uncertainty on an organization keeping its people healthy and safe so the key words there are uncertainty, which is what we don't, so it's the things we don't know. And the way the further the management standard further re refines that is on you know, likelihood and consequence, right? So it's the effect of, of the unknown parts of that. And too often investigations and even risk assessments just focus on what we know. They're not discovering true risk, the true stuff we don't know. And that's where, when you integrate things like you know, hot principles and new view safety or safety one and safety two, they're, def they're designed to generate discovery of things you don't know because an organisation cannot manage what it doesn't know and doesn't understand. Now, I've got a theory about that, being, in, being around a bit as well and, you know, being involved in quite a few incidents, is that when things go wrong, people like really simple, easy, quick conclusions. They, yes. they like to be able to blame something quickly and say that was the problem that's the thing and we fixed it done and dusted yeah. whereas this asks us this process we're talking about here this learn and reduce systemic risk this forces us to take a step back take a breath calm down and go okay well i understand my natural instincts here but i want to uh i need to slow down and actually take a bigger picture, take a more holistic view of what's going on around, yeah. and that that takes that takes practice, that takes that takes self awareness as well, doesn't it? Yep, yeah, and it takes courage. Yeah, it takes courage from leaders because when we dig deep, we're looking at foundation issues, which have been the result of managed senior level management decisions on things like resource engineering and budgeting and FTE and all sorts of things. So it takes courage to do that. How many leaders would want to say, oh, this guy lost his arm and that's my fault? 
because yeah, I didn't he, give adequate resourcing to maintenance or yeah. I didn't give X, Y, Z. And the thing is we need to, we need to get, and the way we do that is to get them to reframe them. It's, it's not their fault, mm. right? Because they, that, again, that's like blaming the worker because they're just a worker too, right? A manager is just a worker. So it's, it's, it's discovering the system that's enabled them to make that error in the business. So, you know, why, why did they not, because they wouldn't have made that decision if they had a no, if they had a no, like no manager makes a decision that they know is going to chop someone's arm off. Yep. So why didn't they know that that risk was there? And that's the system. So we've got to, yep. it, 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 so it's not, it's, and that's the thing, and that's the secret to getting managers to take that courageous step is for to realize we're not attacking them. It's about the system. They're just a worker trapped by the system as well. Yeah. Um, and, and it's that focusing on what failed, not who failed. Yeah. And it's also moving the control, isn't it? We we had a discussion the other day in uh, my online lecture, um, Uni Youth of Sydney, where I'm at. And we're, we're talking about coaching senior leaders and how little impact senior leaders have at the front line in relation to they aren't there all the time. However, the control they do have is over the systems that the frontline users use. And it's the yeah. systems that, that's where they have the control. And if they control the systems correctly, they get the adequate feedback they need. And people, yeah. it's it's the it's that hot principle, isn't it? Yeah. Context drives behavior, excuse me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the context in this context is, is the systems and the controls. This is the systemic yeah. level of control in the organization, isn't it? Yeah. And even if you look at Sherrock's work, you know, on the 10 principles, um, same stuff, right? Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm not actually familiar with Sherrock, to be honest with you. Stephen Sherrock, 10 principles for system safety thinking, I think it's called the book. Worth a look right, at. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah right, so okay. He, he talks about the two, my two favourites that he talks about are emergence and equivalence. Um, so any emergence outcome... Equivalence. Will, yeah, so they're just two of the principles. So the emergence is that, you know, all outcomes emerge from the whole system, the system as a whole. Not So, you know, it's the system as a whole drives all your outcomes. It doesn't matter if it's safety, quality, production, whatever it might be, right? Yeah, um, right. And they're equivalent in that the system doesn't care. It comes out of the same system. Yeah, you know, it's not, a distant, it's not a different system giving you bad outcomes as opposed to good income outcomes. Uh, it's the same system. And that, it's, a, it's, an and outcome. All, it's an outcome. They all emerge from your system in its totality. So, you know, if you've got a purchasing system that allows you to purchase substandard equipment, well, that's substandard equipment is going to end up in your people's hands. Yeah. Um, but if you're, and so, you know, and in that purchasing system, there might have been four other different systems that, you know, everything from safety had a say in it to budgeting to all sorts of systems had a say, the IT people all had a say in that system, all contributes to whatever outcome, be it successful or not, comes out of that one system. Yeah, right. Okay. I'll put a um I'll put a link in the description. Um so yeah. if anyone wants to you know, wants to check that book out um from Mark. Ten principles of system safety. I'll put a link in there as well. All right. Um where did you want to go next, Mark? What did I'll, you want I'll, to I'll just briefly talk about this slide um and then we can get rid of it if you like. Um so once we learn, we work out we're learning, we want to, our objective for an investigation is to learn and, and reduce systemic risk. It really makes us easy to change our focus. The, the, investi the incident just becomes a trigger to learn about that task. So it really pushes us to, to discover normal work, right? So, um, or as Conklin talks about, that work is done, um, really pushes us to discover that because that's where we'll really get the best discovery um, we don't believe in, in um, labels like root causes and contributing factors and causal factors and all that other um, stuff. That they are there in this misguided attempt to help organisations trend events. Um, the problem is, is if you, you never have enough events to statistically trend properly anyway, um, and it can drive um, false safety interventions. Um, so we're more just identify the risk and then fix what's the most highest critical risk to your organization not just because it's got some proximity to what happened on the day um 
the the next one down is about the the, the um, depth of investigations. So typically, we see too many investigations. The depth is just shallow, and, and it's both when I, it's shallow and narrow um, is a, is a probably my, my way I want to uh, really describe that. So normally it's shallow, and they'll say, you know, a worker wasn't trained, so they, the, the, yeah, that's a real cause. So train a worker. Um, yep. But they don't have dis- there's no discovery of why the worker wasn't trained. Uh, and was there no, you know, well, there weren't enough trainers. Well, why weren't there enough trainers? Well, there wasn't enough FTE um, budget allocated for them. Why wasn't there enough budget allocated for them? Well, because we never did a proper analysis of how we analyze what functional support positions we need. Well, how, how do we do that? And really getting down to that rural resourcing and decision making process. Um, so that's it's, that's so that's quite shallow in you know working on train, and yeah. narrow in the face of most or most uh, incidents, especially across organi- multi site organisation or multi multi department organisations, only investigate the event in the context of themselves or their own narrow functional facility. They don't go and ask. So if an event happens in Sydney, they don't go and ask. They've got offices around Australia or overseas. They don't go and ask about that work in the other functions. And there's this... There's no systemic learning. No. So it's only always... It's very narrow in the in the, in the direction of the of the um, organisation, of the facility. So let's just use a single facility. So what happens is um, they'll do an investigation and use whatever methodology they use, and then they'll send out a nice safety alert. Um, you know, it could be a piece of paper. It could be a slide deck. It could even be a video because they're advanced... And they send it out with shared learnings. It ends up on some manager's desk at this other facility. Say it happened in Brisbane and it happened, you know, they've got an office in, I don't know, um, Barcelona. Uh, and the Barcelona manager gets it and goes, well, A, don't, like, what's it got to do with me? And B, as we talked about um, before, David, they've already got 100 other emails they've got to sort through. There's no context for them. So yeah. when we have something, so when I'm talking, you know, when you're nearly like a high potential near miss or a, or a fatality even, we need to make sure the investigation straddles the organisation so it gets systemic-based gotcha. risk. Um, so you need to go and investigate at those other facilities before you publish an investigation report as part of the investigation, not post-investigation, because that's what we want to do is drive change. Right, okay. And this is for high potentials or fatalities. Because well, yeah, that's, that's, that would be quite a lot of resources, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah, it's got to depend on resources. And we'll talk about that yeah. shortly. But, yeah, right. you know, and, and lastly is moving from this, you know, in taking a more collaborative approach around design of, of, of action and, and controls, making sure that the workers are involved, the risk owners are involved, and, and really focusing on that high level of hierarchy of control, you know, elimination, substitution, engineering, isolation, uh, and forgetting about admin, um, focusing on that. And even changing the language from incident investigation to event learning. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing, you know, one of the one of the companies I worked at um, when I was first starting out, that was one of the first things I did was change the, change the form name from incident investigation form to, um, I think I think I actually termed it learning opportunity event or something along those lines and just change yeah. the language and it changes the feeling it changes oh, yeah. the approach it changes yeah. it changes the mindset it changes it changes so the power of language is so powerful when you start talking about things yeah. like this isn't it oh it's amazing and the thing is we start to drive it more towards a, a risk assessment approach right because yeah. a, a risk assessment is an investigation we do before we've had an event an investigation is a risk assessment we do after we have an event. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a few points, well, you mentioned in there with regards to making sure that certain stakeholders are involved and certain people and, you know, they have the capacity yeah. for actually being able to speak. That was ringing bells of learning teams for me as well. But I'm, um, I'm sure we'll probably touch on that a bit later on at some point as well when yeah. we loop in. Yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. All right. Did you want the next slide? Uh, it's up to you. If do you want to, do you want to move into that, or do you want to? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about anything. Would you, would you like to move into the next slide? I'm, I'm easy to do that. Let's have a look at it and see what, see if there's, um, see if there's anything that you want to to bring yeah. up here. So I guess 
Um, what we've done, so we, we um, in conjunction with Yop Havinga, who uh, works at Griffith University um, with um, Sydney Decker and Drew Ray, um, we, we, him and I wrote a paper, um, Event Learning Assessments, which is basically a way of triaging how you learn. Um, so yeah. at the moment, what's happening um, is a lot of organisations are determining the, the level of investigation they do based on purely on outcome. So if they have an LTI, you know, if someone breaks an arm, they have to do like a, a high level investigation. Um, the problem is they're not all created equal and um, yeah, yeah. they end up with a lot of um, poor quality rushed investigations because we just don't have the capacity in an organization to do that many. So, and, and it's day and, 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 and just this focus on outcome alone as what sort of investigation you do, um, you know, has, has significant uh, risk involved. Um, and, and in fact, can be counterintuitive in improving safety. Um, so this, this is uh, in the white paper, um, you can download it from our website, but basically, it's a triage, an alternative triage process to learning. So we're running this out. We've got a number of organisations that have already started using it um, and, and, and love the idea of it. And basically, you know, it's a decision tree. So the first one, was there a credible potential for a critical event? So then we're going to do a blue line, which is our high level investigation methodology that we that we use and espouse. Um, but credible potential. So not getting into too many what ifs here. Because this is the problem. As soon as you add some sort of counterfactual to your to your event scenario, um, you've altered one vari variable, and then your assumption is that no other variables will change. So, one of the you know one of the often ones I see is someone might not have isolated um, an isolation on a plant correctly. Um, now, no one could have credibly been killed because of other other controls in place. But a, a leader will go, but what if it was a different isolation point? Yeah, right. Okay. And, well, suddenly you've, you've, you've created, you've implemented one variable to the scenario and you're assuming that won't impact any other variables of the scenario. And that's, and that's a really dangerous assumption to make because yeah. the worker might, like on, on one isolation point, yeah, it's easy to miss it. On another isolation point, there's no way they'd miss it. So, so it's it's like treating all isolation points with equal consequence, regardless of of which yeah, one equal, was missed. Equal yeah, context. Right. Um, yes. So and 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 in different workers equally and all that. So it's a really dangerous assumption. In fact, you know, um, it's a it's a real it's a, it's a just another sort of side of counterfactuals, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But if there was a credible potential, so we could we were we were we were incredibly lucky that no one got killed. Then we want to do that high level investigation. The next one's about regulating, uh, notify, notifying to regulators. Now, we notify the regulators for all sorts of things because some regulators just keep counts of things. So, if we had to do a high level investigation every time we need a notification, again, it's reducing our capacity because all investigations are breaking work. So, we all, so all of us, we're, we're using resources we hadn't budgeted on using. Um, so there has to be some organisational learning for us to really invest in a, in, a, in, a um, in some sort of investigation. The middle one there is if we had a failure of an absence of a critical control. Now, note there's no credible potential for a fatality, but it's just we've, we've noticed something's failed. So this is an option. This is where we choose. Choose our own adventure. Do we do a learning team, which is a fantastic way of discovering broad systemic risk in an organisation, provided we get the right people in the room? or maybe it does require a high level investigation. So mm -hmm. that's a conversation for the stakeholders and, and you know, with some guidance from um, a safety professional or professional in this space. The last tool where it gets a bit more interesting, uh, well, for me anyway, the, the, the next ones we've had minor, medium, hard, and an organization would define that for themselves and there's organizational learning. What we would do is um, what we call an event insight, which we'll show you shortly, it's, it's, it's a replacement tool for like five whys and, you know, decision trees that exist in people's um, incident databases and recording databases they use, which are, you know, normally old school and based on things like ICAM charts and things like that, which just don't have value. Um, so we'll talk about that in a minute. And the last one there is 
if if there's no we had minor medium harm so we could have broken someone's arm but they fell over their own two feet walking from point a to point b and there, there was nothing wrong why do an investigation just record it report it and move on um now you'll you know that'll take a little bit of investigation in terms of a little bit of learning but that's not an investigation that's just a bit of discovery of what happened um move on and if you go to the and, and basically when we're talking you know uh, organizational learning it's asking questions like this like have there been recent changes in the task because we know if, if changes have been made to a task change management sometimes not held that done that well uh, multiple yeah. controls were there issues with multiple controls so with more complex controls required to, to 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 protect people as a barrier we know there's more likely for failure multiple stakeholders is another one where there are multiple stakeholders involved so you might have contractors clients different business units all involved there's organizational learning to be had in event that that has those sort of issues and lastly could others outside the organization or the team benefit to learn from understanding the issues so that's a conversation that you'd have to determine whether there's what the level of benefit there is to actually go ahead with an investigation of some sort yeah yeah right what came to mind, um, Mark, straight away when you talk about this person, hypothetical person, tripped over their own legs and broke their arm, whatever, and then you said, you know, what can we hope to learn there from an organizational systemic viewpoint? Very little, to be honest with you. Purely a report. Let's go through the injury management process. However, and I know you'd be able to resonate with this as well, and I'm only saying this because um, I've experienced this type of reaction potentially could be okay well we need to get the entire car park graded there can't be any elevation above um four millimeters on the entire site the curbs have to be set to a certain thing we cannot have anybody i've even oh. seen I've, I've been on sites whereby it's mandated that you have to have um shoelace clips to prevent your shoelaces from ever coming undone oh. so that you can't trip over you and know meanwhile meanwhile those same organizations have massive gaps that could kill people. Exactly, exactly. Instead of tripping and potentially cutting a knee or an, a hand, or, which has got nothing to do with the organization. It's just a, well, yeah. all right, let's assume it's got nothing to do with the organization, assuming that the environment yeah. is adequate and you know the PPE is adequate and all that kind of stuff. But then suddenly going, okay, well, we can't have anything. And then it diverts, like you said, it diverts the attention away to the 80 percent of incidents yeah. which are just minor um as opposed to focusing on the sticky you know the stuff that can kill yeah. you yeah. that that's where 80 percent of the effort needs to be focused on that one percent of oh. the incidents that happen the, and that's the whole point of that event of this is to drive focus away from high frequency low consequence events um to 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 low frequency high consequence events yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I've got a, I've got a question about this because this is the first time I've seen this. Really, I mean, I had a few for people who are watching. I had a few uh, screenshots and images from Mark's current website, but he's in the process of, of updating, so he's given me these these new ones. This is the first time I've seen this. I'm being exposed as well. And I take what I really like about it. I like the fact, as you mentioned, it is um, a hierarchy. It is it is a decision tree, but there's no red yellow green there's no um it's not a pyramid it's not one two three four five it's it's nothing it doesn't even look like um a decision tree or a process map it's just literally questions that they can follow and yeah it is put in sequence obviously from the highest credible potential of critical event at the top down to the lowest to the bottom but it's not numbered and I, I like it's a complete shift away from from the stereotypical safety um i suppose bureaucratic documentation that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis isn't it yeah that's why we call ourselves different um we've got to do it differently <laughs> and, well and, the done, well is, <laughs> and, and the thing is well this is part of it so when when we started um, when we founded Investigations Differently, about, about 2018, the end of 2018, um, we knew that we had um, to, to, to innovate. Um, and it's taken us time because we, we really need to focus and understand and then provide practical things yeah. um, that, that, that organisations could integrate. 
So I've got an organisation that's going to integrate this process on deciding um, what level of investigation they're doing, but they're still classifying their events how they always have. So there'll be event classification, but it's it's delinked yeah, yeah, from yeah. its investigation methodology. So we wanted to provide practical things and do them differently, and we also wanted to have some science behind them. So this yeah. is a, as I said, well, this is a collaboration between Joppa Vinga, who um, is a PhD out at Griffith University, uh, working there and lecturer tutor and, and, and does research there, uh, and, and and myself, and and we're really conscious of of making sure, you know, that we had the right question set that were focused on the right things to drive the right because we want a system that drives the right behaviour, right? Yeah. Uh, and this is and this is where we believe, you know, this will will we'll, we'll make a very I think this is something the organisations can implement without a lot of pushback yep. from senior leaders. Yeah, yeah. And for those who don't know as well, your I mean, I know Mark's mentioned a few um, uh, credentials of him there as well, but in, in the safety world, um, he's he's relatively well known. He helped um, Kim Bancroft do an ethnographic study of urban utilities for, I think, it was six or 12 months. He was embedded in the organisation yeah. and to get feedback. He, he's, he's renowned for his... Uh, for his research, um, ethnographic, uh, um, well, yeah, I suppose, you know, his research capabilities and the fact that he bases everything on science and on evidence-based. Um, so he's got a lot of credential in the industry. It's just something that I wanted to put out there as well. Yeah, that no, was great. Awesome. Enjoy working with you. Yeah. I yeah, I really like this, mate. And I, I can see, I can see how it's, it's neutral, you know, there is, as I mentioned, when you take away the greens and the reds and the yellows and, you know, the matrix, you know, four by yeah. four, whatever it is, or it comes across, it lands a lot um, gentler, uh, 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 a lot less safety and a lot more um, natural. And natural is, I think, the words that's come into mind, you know what I mean? I just find it logical and it just makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Let's have a look at this slide eight from the yeah. back, uh, and we'll have a, a quick ch chat about this. This is this is what you said. This was um, your pro the um, your new process you're working on. At Investigation oh, no, no, we've, yeah, so we've we've launched this. So oh, okay. yeah, so this is a, uh, the second white paper that Yop and I wrote together. We launched them at the same time um, because <laughs> they, they they needed to be hand in hand because one fed directly to the other. Um, yep. So we need to sort of have them hand in hand. So basically um, what we see for a lot of those minor medium uh, investigations that we force on supervisors and safety advisors and, and all sorts of people are, are tools like five wires or root cause trees that are, that are, you know, derived in software. Um, and too often, you know, the, the book of answers doesn't match up to really what's there. There's very little learning. We see a lot of blame. We see a lot of worker not trained or a worker didn't do a risk assessment or didn't identify the risk and all that other nonsense. So we wanted to replace it with a more humble inquiry uh, approach, reminiscent of learning teams, but not a full-on learning team. Uh, because this is from events where you've had minor, medium harm. So yeah, we've done a bit of damage. Yeah. You know, it could be to a human, it could be to equipment, it could be to quality, it could be to the environment or whatever. But, and there's some organisational learning as we've discussed before. So this is the question set. The first three are about the event and just to make sure that there's a good understanding of actually what happened. So we're not looking at why it happened, just what happened. Um, you know, and, 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 and a little, I guess a little bit of why. So, you know, walk me through the event, nice open question, you know, describe it, you know, you might, and you'd want to ask that where it happened, right? The second question is about surprising. What surprised you? Because... When workers go and do a job um, and it goes wrong, um, they didn't plan for it to go wrong. Yeah. Now, they, they might have known there was a risk of it going wrong. That's different to knowing it's going to go wrong. They didn't plan for it to go wrong. In fact, they planned for it to go right. So for some reason, something surprised them whilst doing the task and it went pear-shaped. Um, now, they might know that thing that surprised them might have been a known risk, but it's still surprising that it eventuated. So that's really cool to learn. Yep. The third question there is about could things have gone worse? And that's that's the the good, are we good or are we lucky? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know? So they're the first three questions and why did it not happen? So really important to know 
because it's a positive questions, right? Because if things could have gone worse, why didn't they? Well, because the control worked. Well, why did it work? Was it were we lucky that it worked, or was it because no, that's a good control? Well, I, that's a business. I want to know about that, right? In Todd um, Conklin's parlor, it says, "Did we fail safely?" Yeah, yeah, exactly, uh, and gently, yeah. and gently, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and the next three questions are about, and this is where we switch. So we go into sort of that learning team mode or that learning mode about the task. So. You know, what, when it goes well, what must go right? And that's a question I actually ask when I facilitate learning teams. What, you know, when it goes well, what's what's working for you? And they'll tell you all the things that don't go well, by the way, when they tell you that. But it's positively framed, right? Because we want to make things positive. Um, what frustrates you? Um, because we know when workers are frustrated, they'll adapt, they'll innovate, they'll change things. It's because things are out of their control. They're not working. They don't have the right tools or whatever it might be. And that's where we really start to see the blue, line, the blue line really impacted. And sometimes that's where the blue line probably has its sharpest curves is because they're frustrated and they're just trying to get the job done. Um, the, the sixth question is my f absolute favourite of the question set. And they said, what could management better understand about this task? How many times have you been in the field, and we've all experienced this, where workers have said, if only those bloody people in the ivory tower knew exactly yeah, what yeah, yeah, what's yeah. going on here, they'd have a fit. Well, they, they would. So let's tell them. And I'm going to tell them for you. So, yeah. you know, that what, what, what do they need to know? Because they can't manage what they don't know and don't understand. So let's help them. Let's, be, let, let's do that genuinely uh, and ask that question. So I love that question. I've got a question for you about that, Mark, about six, because I think that's a great question as well. And all of these, um, all of these in their essence, what they are, is they are great questions. Yeah. They are great questions to elicit great responses or great answers, as opposed to limiting any answers. But this number six is great. My question to you around it is, um, once we have the people in the field, or once we tell them, look, you know, the people in the ivory tower, to use your example they need to know what kind of journey do those people in the ivory tower need to go on in order to be able to hear that information uh, so i guess that comes back to and i'll leverage um hop again that yeah, response to failure matters right so that that's where we have we have we need to have that response management response conversation with our leaders before something goes wrong yeah, right. So that, that's on that's incumbent on us as as leaders in this to to go and, and educate and frame and 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 improve their understanding of our leaders that and because they know they can't manage what they don't know about the thing is they they think they might they don't know what they don't know yeah so once we we frame it correctly and we bring them on board. Um, and where we've where we've done this, we've actually had leadership endorsement to bring this process in. Um, they get it. They want to know. They, they, you know, most leaders, you know, ninety nine percent of leaders are great people, just trying to do a good job, and they have their own constraints, their own context, their own stories, um, and they're also overworked. Um, yeah. So it's a matter of of having that empathy with them, and, and really trying to understand that. It's not your fault you don't know about this. We, we haven't got a system in place that generates this. And quite frankly, if anyone needs to take the blame, it's the bloody safety industry. Yes, um, definitely. definitely. The, and the reason these have to be great questions is because the safety industry has had such a bad reputation of control, command, authoritarian, oh. all of the, all those things that you saw both in the AFP yeah. and in some of the mindset organisations. People who have been in these industries have historically abused them. Yeah. That's a broad statement. And I don't mean it for everybody. Obviously there's no, great people yes. out there. It's a generalization, but hang on, you know, we've perpetuated, um, you know, linear thinking, we've perpetuated blame, we've perpetuated punishment, we've perpetuated risk assessments that, that are tick and flick. You know, we've, 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 for God's sake, we, we, get, we gave them TRIFA. <laughs> we gave them injury frequency weights. So they, they didn't invent that. We invented that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we perpetuated it, so it's all on us, right? So once, yeah, yeah. once we, we need, that's all part of ours is, is facilitating their understanding and training. That's the, the you have to do that, 
and and you have to create the space in your organization to do that as well yeah richie and and and, and question seven there is just about and you know that collaboration with them how could we fix it um and then the and then the and the, and the supervisor or, or safety advisor just goes away and says okay well what can we do let's do this right there's no analysis required here yep. there's no there's no this is remember we put this where it belongs in that minor medium harm some organizational learning let's put some stuff in place that we can do now this might trigger um, a bigger investigation it might tr trigger a learning team but if used correctly um, it should take uh, you know a leader no longer than a couple of hours to pump out investigation um, that actually might achieve something that their workers will go oh, okay yeah that's good we got something yeah. out of that because they were involved their opinion was listened to and, yeah. and you know they they weren't they weren't blamed along the way also no there's there's no question about why didn't you do you know something yeah. um no, again I so i think the white paper again on their website um you can download it um i think it's called event insights making minor incidents matter uh again co-written with yop um we're really proud of it um and, and it's come from a lot of, um, like it's come from five years of research with our clients. Well, this is a prime time, Mark, because I wanted to make sure we got um, a walk around your, a brief walk around your website anyway. So this may be a prime time for us to show people where to go to access this white paper since we've been talking yeah. about it. So if you talk me through that. Right, right at the top um, of the page, you'll see yeah. there's, two links um, to the white papers. So those blue boxes. Oh, right. um, yeah. So we're, they're, they're up there temporarily while um, we're actually redoing our website, but we should have that in the next few weeks, but they'll still be quite easy to find. Uh, if you click on any either of those links, it'll take you through to two page summaries uh, because the white papers themselves can, you know, they can be quite heavy reading, uh, you know, 8 yep. or 20 pages with, with citations. Um, so. Uh, but if you scroll down, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the learning assessment one, um, you'll see a link in that document to the full white paper as well. Um, there it is. So there. There, there, there's the link there. And that, if, if you click on that, you get the full, the full. Uh, I think that's about 20 pages that white paper. Um, because we wanted it's to make sure. a different that, window, but yeah, it is. Uh, opens up in a different window, does it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't do the website. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do my. I do all my all myself for my sins, which is probably why mine isn't yeah. as smooth as this. But and then the event insights making minor incidents matter. That's yeah, that that's last um, well. yeah. last one we went through there. So, for those of you listening, if you want further details, more information, downloadable stuff, uh, yeah. then we've obviously got the summaries here, the the pretty PDF summaries, and then we have the actual um, empirical articles in the background as well. Yeah. So and that's we, all there on the website. And we made a deliberate decision, David, to give those away. You, you do not even need to put in your email address to download either of those. Um, yeah, right, okay. So, you know, we're not collecting anyone. I mean, if you want to give us your email address, don't worry, we'll use it. Um, but but obviously, um, you know, according to Privacy Act. Um, but, yeah, you can, you can, there's a contact form on the website. You can contact us. Um, there's emails and things like that. So, but, yeah, we made a deliberate decision because... Um, we, we truly believe that this will improve um, how work gets done um, yeah. in organisations. So. Awesome. That's our media this page. Is... <laughs> um, it's a bit of it, we've got we've got to update it, um, and that's the hence the new website because it's it, it, the way it was designed was a little bit hard to to do it. But there's a, a set of webinars in there, um, and. YouTube videos and and all sorts of things that people can download and have a look at their video logs. Um, yeah. Taking time. And for those of you as well who remember our very first interview um, on this um, series where we interviewed, where we had a chat with Andy Schoen um, yeah. from South Park Pacific and he's got the Hop Lab. Um, Mark and Andy work very closely together as well because um, Obviously, there's there's a very close connection between both Hop learning yeah. teams, investigations differently. They all they all mesh really well together in relation to 
how leaders react to situations, yeah. how the context drives behavior, how error is normal. Yeah. You know, they're all part and parcel of of this um, more humanistic way of approaching safety and approaching, as I mentioned right at the very beginning before you came on, Mark. For me, how I see investigations is they are the they are the pinnacle. They are the sharp end. That's where people deal with safety on a day to day basis. Sure. But it's when something bad happens, that's when they really deal with safety. And the organization, that's when the organization has got the biggest, um, uh, I suppose, responsibility on them and how they enact that safety on their people or to their people. Um, and for me, that's the real pointy sharp end. That's where, as a practitioner myself, that's where I notice the biggest, in, the biggest changes could be made for the smallest buck, which was how we treat our people when things don't go well or yeah. things don't go as intended. Um, so a couple so of things there, year. David. First, yeah, um, Southpac International and Hop Lab, worth a look at. They do some great work, especially in that learning team space. Um, the Nothing reveals the culture of an organisation more than how it deals with unwanted, unplanned events. Um, yeah. That nothing, nothing reveals their character or their culture more around how they deal with safety and how they deal with the workers and how they deal and how they respond to those things, uh, to those events. And, uh, and that's where we can have such a massive impact, as you said. Definitely agree with you on that, both from a practitioner viewpoint and from, yeah. from, um, you know, from my insights in, in psychology as I'm going through, um, you know, my current degrees and, you know, my past degrees as well, the way that people are treated, uh, and the way we, the way we interface and the way we operate with people makes the biggest difference to the type of information we get, which is why I, I, I went back earlier on to talk about these are great questions because we there are lots of great answers out there, but they're, they're just floating around. They need a great question for you to yeah. be able to have access to them. And if you don't ask the great questions, you're missing out on yeah. all information. Why don't you talk us through quickly um, here? I see you've got a training section on yeah. your website and i know you said this is be, this is all being updated and it's yeah. all going to be renewed but um are there any upcoming events you want to talk about or or, or mention uh, yeah so we, we we offer um training both internal and external both on investigations in risk management um and we and so that's our we mainly work internally with organizations however we do run about three times a year public online courses so we've got a public online course on um which is just a one-day training um, that's coming up in March, but that's sold out, unfortunately. There is another one in June. If you look on our website, you'll be able to see dates on that. But they, they tend to sell out fairly quickly. Uh, we also do a half-day one on how to do better risk assessments, how to facilitate yeah. better risk assessment shop workshops. Um, but we are we are releasing very shortly um, investi different levels of investigation training. So we're, we're going to be re releasing our advanced investigation masterclass, which is going to... Uh, be a lot more technical, in, especially around the control space uh, and, and how we argue for higher level controls and, and really um, uh, leveraging off technical risk principles. Uh, and yes. on the other end, we're doing ones on um, a, a, a supervisor, one day supervisor course. So th those will be out shortly. Um, but if you've got anyone's got a training inquiry, they can, they can just um, fill in out one of those contact forms or there's a million of them on that website. Um, yeah, yeah. And and, uh, and send us a, a request, and uh, we'll, we'll get back to you and we'll discover what you need. Um, the bespoke training we do, so our internal training is all bespoke. So that probably is what sets us apart from anyone else. Is that when we when we um, work with an organisation, um, we tailor the training for them. So we use their imagery, their processes, their the incident scenarios relative to them. So if we're working with a uh, land management company, it might be an arborist scenario. If we're working with a transport logistics, it'll be like a, maybe a forklift scenario. If we're working with a mining company, it'll be a mining scenario. Um, and, and we really work on the design of the training so it fits them. So if they, yeah. you know, for example, they might want it plugged into another model as well, we'll plug it into the other model for them as well. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a real co-design approach to make, so rather than off the shelf. So a lot of our competitors, it doesn't matter what training it is. It's the same one for every industry and every organisation. Um, creates a lot more work for us, but um, we believe we get better engagement and, and, um, and um, 
implementation and sustainability out of uh, that uh, tailored approach. Why would why would you do that, Mark? Because I mean, anyone would think that you were saying there that context of the organisation matters. I mean, that's that's ridiculous. That's absolutely I know, right? ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and this, why aren't why aren't all uh, why aren't all organisations the same? And one training fits all. Uh, well, yeah, I think we know the answer to that, don't we? I think we know the well, answer to that. Well, sometimes training, sometimes so some organisations do internal training for themselves because they can't get it externally for them. So they try and do the they try and do that that internally. The problem is it's always compromised because the person, the people normally doing it, have got five other jobs they're doing. They're not. Uh, then they might be good at the topic they're looking at, but they're not experts in it, and they don't have the time to go and do the the, the modern re the research that we we do as part yeah. of doing it. I don't think, um, I think every single course that we run out is slightly different because we're always um, adding to it. You know, I was just in Wollongong last, uh, the other month there at the Global Innovation Safety Summit, listening to Conklin and Decker and, you know, Maeve and, and, and Zoe Nation and, and Andrea Baker and Bob Edwards and all those wonderful names um, speak and I'm like, I'm, I'm like, my notebook is like, oh my God, I'm writing down so much stuff. I'm like, and then I come back and I'm like, I don't know where I'm going to put that in, but it needs to be in here somewhere. Um, you know, it just it just like got so excited, uh, and then I had to bring yeah, yeah. it. Um, <laughs> so, and that's the that's the beauty of what we do is is that we have that time. Um, so, with that external capability that that's internally focused. Yeah, yeah. No, I like it. I like it a lot. Hey, Mark. Before we wrap up, we've got about four four yeah four or five minutes if we need it. Can I be? Can I? Can I pick your brain about? Yes, um, so we've got these systems and we've got these um, approaches, and a common theme all, all the way through this has been, um, well, all the way through all these methodologies we're talking about is the human being as being an important facet of of everything. Um, either the people that are having things done to them, you know, bad things happen to them, or people who are in control of the systems that those other people operate within it's all about individuals um how important is it do you think for those individuals to if they're going to go through changes in how they approach something like investigations to have support and to have that um uh space that they can talk about it as well that they can that they can reflect and they can discuss their own fears and their own motives and their own you know personal agendas as well i mean that that comes into it how important is the individual in all of this process to you oh, it's center right um the, the individuals are center in, in in from a in, from a number of different um ways but if we look at the 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 work of themselves the person themselves the individual themselves we actually have as organizations a duty of care to manage their psychological harm uh, and hazards that we impact on them, and 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 you know the the new code of practice in Australia, and and and, and obviously this psychosocial harm is becoming, uh, you know, it's all, it's almost a flavour of the month. Um, is is a hard thing, is a you know terrible way of phrasing it, but it is. Um, yeah. And we need to understand that that they, um, and and and, and Decker talks about it as the second as the second victim, right? So they they're hurt once, and then they're hurt again. Um, through the investigation, so by by taking this open approach and this and, and, you know this this new it's not even new it's been around for decades this thinking but nearly implemented to, by taking this approach of putting them at the centre in their care and and, and and understanding them at the centre is 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 really going to make a massive difference to to their happiness. Every organisation I work with at the moment is struggling for staff. Yep. Um, a high turnover, can't keep enough staff, lots of psychosocial harm, job demands versus job resources. Why, why, why don't we want to protect them? Why do you know well, we've got good staff? We should like if we, you know, I, I'm, I, I don't know how many times I've heard leaders say, you know, our people are our most important asset. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll prove it. We'll yeah. prove it. If people are your most important asset, why do you treat them worse than you treat a car? Or a vehicle, you know, treat them. Yeah, you know, they, they they deserve better than that. So, by by making them centered on them and how they do their work, and it, and it's a, it's a true essence of human of human factors, right? 
is is focusing on the humans interaction with the system and the equipment and the environment if by yeah. focusing on them on, on how their, their interaction and by focusing on the what fail not the who fail and and embracing them um you know you, you're going to see a, a far better um outcome um probably a, a really good case study to look at um and, and i'm going to just plug someone else for a second um, here, yep. David, if I can. Josh Bryant from Mitchell Services oh, yeah. um, did a uh, presentation at the Global Innovation Safety Summit, um, and he talked about one of his guys called Seb who hurt himself. If you want to see a restorative just culture in action, have a look at that presentation. Now, Josh is also um, just... Is that available for, online? Um, that, that I don't know if it is for con conference attendees, but for non-conference attendees, Josh just presented on Safety Exchange. I don't know, are you aware of Safety Exchange? Yes, Dave Prosen's uh, platform. Yep, Dave and Nathaniel's. Um, he just like literally, I hung up that to come onto this. Um, right, okay. Um, he, he, he just did it today at, at 10 a.m. Uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time this morning. Uh, so that you should be able to go into Safety Exchange. Uh, and he talks about that case study right towards the end of his presentation. So if you want to have a look at, uh, at a company that can, and this is a drilling mining contractor. Yeah. You know, they are literally one of the toughest gigs in the game um, where they would, you know, um, sack people left, right and centre traditionally. If you want to see how someone can embed these in one of the toughest industries in the world and the restorative just culture they have, and, and this kid who got hurt and how they looked after him, how they rallied around him, how they embraced them to learn what they, what their ownership was in the event rather than blame, but there's not a better case study going around. My great, that's great. I may even reach out to Josh and ask him if um, he's, he's, he's willing to share that as well so I can put a link um, yeah. in this as well so that people don't have to go through several platforms to get there. But uh, that sounds amazing. That sounds amazing. And, uh, you know, Josh is... I mean, you know, Josh, most people in the safety arena in Australia know Josh as well. He's done he's done amazing things and he's been publicly publicly rewarded and recognized oh. for those um, efforts that he's made. And he he wasn't even he, he's not even a safety person, is he? He was a geologist, wasn't he, by trade? And then he became yeah. general manager of of Mitchell Drilling Services. And then he's just he's like, no, we need to make the people the center of everything we do. Yeah. And then he started out with hot principles and uh, investigation yeah, differently so principles and learning about, teams. Yeah. He'll tell you about his journey. He'll kill me for saying this. He is multi-award winning. Um, he will hate me for saying that, by the way. But no, <laughs> but deservedly so. So yeah, Josh yeah. did have a background in geology, but but what Josh had was uh, in, in, in what he has and still has to this day is insatiable curiosity. Yes, um, and, and a passion um, for caring for his people. So the combination of those two uh, was what's made Josh as effective as he is. Um, yeah. and, and his operational background, because he was an operational geologist, um, really lends itself to his understanding of, of work as normal. Um, so, yeah, he, and, and he's done what he's done on a shoestring budget um with and just by influence um has he managed to achieve what he's done um but yeah in social curiosity um one of my favorite people he came out from memory um from a training with with um south Park. he came out with 100 small steps towards hop which as you said didn't involve any yeah. didn't involve any uh expenditure or cost really it was doing small subtle things a hundred yeah. times that mounts up to something that makes yeah. a meaningful change in the organization, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. So the hundred small steps came from somewhere else before um, before Southpac and Learning Teams. He actually did a safety um, different course with Dan Hamadar. Uh, him oh, yeah. and I, I think I, there was myself, him, I think Ken Bancroft and a few others on it. And we walked away going, okay. Because um, I was, I was um, helping him um, as well. And it was like, geez, um, everything we've done is um, well-intentioned, but okay, we need to take a different approach. And and, and 100 Small Things was uh, Josh's idea of how we can, uh, as a way of starting that approach. Um, and gotcha. um, so, yeah. But look, 
you invite Josh, mate. He, he, he's more than capable of telling his own story. Yeah, will do. Will do. Appreciate that. And on that note, Mark, I just want to extend my thanks to you because I know you're busy. You're bouncing around between yeah. jobs and you got training and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate your time today. Um, and I'm sure, you know, people who are watching it, um, you know, please pop over to, to his website as well, to Mark's website. It is going to be updated soon from what he says, but um, it's still at the moment. Investigations .com.au. Investig Investigations There'll be a link in the description below. So pop, pop on over, the, oh, over to there. <laughs> I just got Try and find it. If you can find, find it, go there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations, David, on the on the on the um, YouTube channel, mate. It's great to see it's being a success and you're getting getting uh, getting some great subscribers. So that's fantastic. Well done. I much appreciate that. Thank you very much, Mark. And um, we'll no doubt catch up soon. No worries. Thanks, David. Catch you.